And Finnish, I was introducing in my introductions, talking about how you grew up in an activist family and worked in the NGO sector and, mm -hmm. and with the traditional forms of campaigning and activism and how through your own hobby of craft you sort of switch strategy to a slower and gentler way of activism, if I've understood correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and in that you use craft as a catalyst, a vehicle and a tool to um, shed light into the social and environmental injustices, both locally and globally, that exist in the world. Um, I mentioned your long list of achievements, and this will make you a bit embarrassed, I know, but it's amazing that you give lectures worldwide and speeches mm. on cra about craftivism, and, and that you have these workshops and you know are an amazing inspiration for us all. Um, yeah, I think uh, we are tonight very honored and deeply grateful that you've made the effort to come here and we will welcome you, Sarah, uh, to come and talk about and discuss your work. And um, now the stage is yours. Kitas, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. I'm sorry I'm awful at Finnish. Um, and even though I do lots of talks, I still get very nervous, so I'll be drinking my tea to stop my nerves. Um, I'm going to talk for hopefully just half an hour and then we're going to have a discussion for half an hour um, to make it as relevant and useful to you guys as possible and not to just hear me. I could talk for hours about what I do, so I will <laughs> limit what I say. Um, but I'm going to talk about five key methodologies for me of how I use craft in activism um, and first talk a little bit about my journey because I just... For me, I find that really interesting hearing other people's journey in and it, it explains a lot about why I, how I use craft and activism that might be different to other forms of craftivism. Um, and then there's Q&A and then there's questions at the end. And then if you're too nervous to ask a question in front of each other, we'll be mulling around at the end as well. So you can just come up and we can have a chat. Um, and you can always get my email address if you're even too nervous to speak to me. But I'm very nice, I promise. <laughs> um, I've got some slides so you don't have to look at me. Um, you can look at the actual work. Um, and I'm just want, I just want to give a bit of an overview. Like I said, I could talk about the minutiae and the detail for hours, but I just want to give you a bit of a flavour so that you can then ask more questions, really, um, rather than me tell you everything. So the first thing, this is the cover of my little book of craftivism, and it says, evil flourishes when good people do nothing. And it's an Edmund Burke quote. And for me, that's sort of my my priority in a way, my main motivation um, when I see injustice in the world is what really aggravates me is when I see injustice that could quite easily be changed, I think. So when I see, you know, sweatshops still existing, which I'm sure you all know about, especially because of this course, I just think if we, you know, could buy more ethically, if we could change our habits, if we could, you know, really um, behave differently, that could be a problem that we could change over time like we have with apartheid like we have with civil rights women's um voting those type of things i just find it really frustrating that we we just let it happen and i think it's we let it happen because we tend to forget that we can make a change or we don't connect to who makes our clothes sometimes or we forget because we're so busy so my passion really is i do see evil flourishing when we don't tackle the issues but it also makes me excited that if we do tackle the issues we can change things and we do live in such an incredible world where i can come to helsinki and be on a live stream and talk to you guys it's such a we've got so many amazing things that happen i just don't want to um, give up on making lots of other things happen for the better. So that's sort of my main thing. Um, but my background, is of the, as all of us, it shaped me. Um, so there's this, this little boy with a mullet, you can see, is actually me. My mum used to cut my hair and make our clothes. Um, so I do look like a little boy, but that's fine. Um, I grew up in a very low income area in the UK in the 80s, so in the 1980s under a Thatcher government, so extremely right wing government in a very low income area where 
we had a welfare state that diminished massively. So I'm very jealous of Finland and what you're achieving and the solidarity and equality that you have that we sort of are, are losing a bit in the UK and in America. Um, so I grew up around incredible people who are extremely hardworking, extremely talented, extremely passionate and loving, but what was stopping them from fulfilling their potential and from helping other people wasn't money in the sense of getting money from people or donated clothes. It was it was injustice. It was structures stopping people fulfilling their potential. So it was very much about policy changes um, that needed to be changed, not people just wanting new socks that could be donated or flown in. So I think my thing for activism for me and the definition of activism is changing structures of social of social injustice so it's not about fundraising it's not about donating or those um quick emergency relief that's still needed a lot but for me activism is really challenging the root cause of injustices whether it's human greed or whether it's laws that need to be changed but it's looking at those root causes and if we can change them then naturally injustices will go away so I was surrounded by these incredible people who were campaigning locally so this is a photograph of our in our local newspaper and it says pulpit power because we strangely have two bishops in Liverpool because I think we're very competitive as a city, we like to be different. Um, and we had both bishops support a local campaign, you can see housing here that was social housing that was going to be knocked down to build um, a park in our local area that no one wanted and would have made the area much more unsafe. And it would have moved families and generations of families from the local area to other parts of Liverpool where people don't couldn't afford to have cars or didn't, it was very um, low employment, very bad health care, lots of issues with confidence and education. So it would really have pulled communities apart um, and it was a very close-knit community that was struggling in so many ways that to lose their home wouldn't have helped anyone. So we squatted in these houses. So age three, along with my brother and sister and my parents, my dad's the local vicar. My mum now is a local politician, but wasn't at all and was more shy than I was. Um, but we campaigned locally to save these houses, which we did. And then 10 years later, we saved to get better health care, which we did, and um, more support for helping people get back into work, help with literacy issues. We had a huge, we still have huge issues in Everton about malnutrition, hunger, lots of problems, which I find shocking in, in the global north um, still. But I could see from a very early age that campaigning to change things did work but that there was always different ways of how it worked. So from the age of three onwards, I was, a, I was an observer and I'm more of an introvert, like Elisa said, so I observe a lot, um, but I never feel like I wanna be on the front row with a placard shouting and screaming or in you know fancy dress or saying, look at me, that's not really the way I do it. So I would watch how they won. So it might be getting media attention, getting influential people like bishops or religious leaders or politicians involved, or whether it was doing an alternative to the economic system that then would change the system. But always, I'm a bit of a geek, I always look at how we can change things, whether it is in air, whether it is behaviours, whether it is habits, whether it is policy, all of that stuff. So I naturally ended up working in the NGO world. I worked for, like Elisa said, I worked for Oxfam. Um, I worked for the Department for International Development in the UK, but specifically on public engagement. So helping people to connect and understand global injustices and the complexities of them and how we could be good global citizens. So whether that was as a voter, or as a consumer and the consumer power we have, or as a neighbor, an employee, all of the different roles we have, and whether we like it or not, we have influence and we have responsibilities. So everything we do has an impact. So I was trying to help people figure out how they could have a positive impact rather than a negative one. So my background has been in development and campaigning. Um, so that's a bit about me. So you're probably thinking, how does craft come involved in this and for me it, 
I got into craft because I love, like a lot of you knitting and crochet and stuff here, which I love to watch. Um, I was getting very itchy fingers because I all of a lot of my work was online, as most work is, or on the street, being an extrovert and being around lots of people, which drains me of energy. I like one-to-ones or being on my own a lot. Um, and a lot of online work, so constantly like this. But I was getting very itchy fingers. I wanted to make things. I wanted to make something tangible and be creative, which I couldn't in my job so much. And I had big targets, and I was traveling around the country for um, a lot of my work. So I picked up a cross-stitch kit, which was about this big, um, just over five years ago, um, because I saw it in a shop and I thought, oh, well, I'll do that because I can't, I love painting, but I can't paint on trains or on the tube or on the bus. So I'll pick up a little cross-stitch kit. Um, and I noticed straight away, like I'm sure a lot of you do, that it slowed me down, which it, it made me be far more mindful about how I was having very quick, shallow breath. I was very anxious about the world and injustices. I was very concerned about how I constantly fe felt burnt out and exhausted. I felt like the traditional forms of activism I didn't fit into because I'm more of an introvert, because I wanted to have deep conversations with people and not just treat them as robots and say, quickly sign this petition, it's really important, and then go on to the next person, quickly sign this, and not have conversations about the complexities of injustice and how we can be involved in different ways. And I also um, was getting quite sceptical of a lot of campaigning methods. So you can, you might hear the terms clicktivism nowadays and slacktivism, about quick, easy activism. And because I used to work for large NGOs and I, s and I have lots of friends who work in parliament and work in NGOs and campaigning and charities, I still read a lot of reports that I can get hold of about what influences politicians and business people and what actually helps them change some of their policies. And a lot of it isn't the number of petitions anymore and we have to acknowledge that. It is, they really want to see how people are committed to, to these changes. Because if it's so easy to sign a petition, politicians just go, well, how do I know they actually care? Why am I gonna make a change if these people who I want to vote for me don't actually care? So they tend to look a lot more at trend forecasts, at behavioral change, at conversations within the media, at conversations on social media, and um, particular groups like mothers groups, highly influential in the UK. <laughs> so I work a lot with women's institutes, um, which are a big institution in the UK. So always trying to see who is the most influential, which is not always that ethical in many ways, but being very aware of some people are more influential than others and how we can make change in a strategic effect way um, and I want to quickly run through five headings really just as a checklist for you to spark off some thoughts or ideas from you of where I think craft is useful um, and it also hints at where craft might not be useful so the first thing I noticed which I mentioned about I saw that craft was slow and it was therapeutic and it calmed me down and you know a lot of you are nodding like that's why you're doing it it's you know very um, exciting creative thing to do. Um, I also noticed that it was a really powerful way to do inner activism. So I'm talking about activism, like I said, about structures and behaviors that we need to change, not about transactions, very much about transformation. And if we want to change the world or we want to change other people, we have to start with ourselves. I mean, it's common sense, really, but we often forget it. We get angry about an injustice and we look for a scapegoat. We look for someone to blame, to go, you're wrong, I'm right, you need to do this, which means we don't have to look at how we might be part of the problem because we can just say it's your fault. And it's human nature and it means that we don't have to look at how we might be part of the problem, which you know, we often don't want to do. And craft is a great tool for distraction from that as well, which is healthy sometimes. But I wanted craft to be a really useful tool for deep engagement rather than distraction because it is a very comforting thing because, so all my craftivism is embroidery or cross stitch mostly because it is very repetitive. So it's not on machines, it's hand movements so that I could stop and think and not try and multitask and try and do too many things. I could focus on this one issue for hours because all of my projects take hours and it would force me to discipline myself to really look at a particular issue and say, okay, how am I part of the, 
the the ugly side of fashion. There's a beautiful side of fashion, and I still love reading Vogue, and I love fashion, but there's an ugly side that we should change. And I want all of fashion to be beautiful industry, not just the final product. So while I'm stitching, because of the comfort of craft, I can challenge myself to think about uncomfortable things. Whereas when I was on my own watching the news or without craft in my hand, I would get so depressed and uncomfortable and feel disempowered that actually it was really unhealthy and it wasn't good for my well-being or for feeling burnt out it wasn't good to sustain me um, I was getting in a downward spiral so craft was a really physical aesthetically beautiful but also very soft gentle thing for me to engage with these uncomfortable things using the comfort of craft. That was the main thing I saw. And that's what I was keen that other people would use this tool to think quite long and hard about our involvement in the complexities of injustice. So we might not come out with answers, but we'll come out with a lot more questions. We'll see where we need to know more information that we might not know. We can challenge some of our immediate response, which might be, I want to help the homeless, so I'm going to knit them a blanket. But we need to look at, well, do they need a blanket? Do they want a blanket? Am I treating them with respect and dignity? Am I empathising with them? Can I put myself in their shoes for a long time and think very strategically about why are people homeless? What role have I got to play in it? Rather than quickly trying to make solutions, it was very much a slow process. Um, and also, like these footprints, which I've got a few kits with me you can have a look at at the end. It's a really good physical reminder because we live on such a digital um, world now. It's a physical thing to remind us to always keep on the right path. So this shoe print at the top, you can see a little bit of it. It's on my bookshelf in my bedroom. So when I leave my bedroom, I see it on the way out and I don't have to read it each time, but it reminds me every morning, am I making a positive difference in the world? Am I on a, a good journey to be a good global citizen or do I need to keep in check with myself? Because everything's so fast now that our automatic pilot means that we often don't think about other people because we've got things we need to do. So every time I see this, it stops me in my tracks to say okay I need to remember to smile at my neighbours to treat people the way I want to be treated to think intentionally as much as possible about what I do and how I do it so that I don't by accident or on purpose do things that harm others and that physical metaphor I felt that was in craft that I spent a long time doing, which made me take ownership of it, was far more impactful than me having a, a poster up that I might have printed off online or got from, from a charity. It really um, engaged with me much deeper. And one of our craftivists in the world says it much better than my rambles when she said, my small act of craftivism will hopefully go some small way towards changing the world, but more importantly, it's changed me. And I think that's really important that if we want to be good global citizens and good activists, we need really strong roots in our values um, and in our activism to then do other things to then engage other people. But if we don't have those strong roots and know what we're doing, then often we can do things that just aren't strategic at all. And we just get really angry and do things that then we regret. So the second one um, is, I felt like activism was quite aggressive. It wasn't gentle. You know, most traditional activism I saw throughout a lot of history, but also um, in the last 10 years I've worked in activism and before I'm 30 now, can you believe it? I look so young. <laughs> um, is that it was very aggressive. For one, as a woman, I felt it was quite masculine in terms it was very hierarchical. It was often bullying people. So I hinted before we try and get a scapegoat and blame one person or one type of people for everything rather than look at our own involvement. It was lots of um, shouting at people rather than conversations. And it was very much in an activist bubble of once in a while you're an activist and then normal life, you're not an activist. It was sort of very separate black and white things. And I was doing like what traditional activists were doing. I was sending petitions to my politician and I was writing a letter saying, I really care about these issues and then just sending them to her. And what was a really good challenge for me was um, my MP at the time, two years ago when I made her this handkerchief, um, her office sent me a, an email back telling me to stop contacting 
her office. They said it was a waste of my time and their time and a waste of charity's money for me contacting them. And I immediately thought, how awful, you're a really bad MP, how dare you say that, surely you want my vote. But it was a really good challenge because it made me think, actually, I'm not engaged in this politician who was a, a new politician. I wasn't engaging her as a real human being. I wasn't empathising with her and thinking, what's the best way to engage this person and work with her where we agree and challenge each other where we don't. Um, and the reason I made the handkerchief was because I was grappling with this issue of, well, how do I show my politician that I genuinely care about all of these is different issues that for me came under inequality? So from tax avoidance to unethical sweatshops to the welfare state disappearing to big business making profit rather than focusing on people. She, it, look, it could look like I just didn't care when I was just signing everything when I genuinely did, did care. So I embroidered a, this is a replica. Here's, is this one with little flowers on, but it's the same size. So I decided to embroider a handkerchief because I had a pack of handkerchiefs and I thought I could give this to charity. I'm not going to use them because I have another hanky. Um, and it sparked off an idea because it was about blowing your nose. And I thought I could use this as a really, I want to show my MP that I genuinely care. Crafting takes a long time. It's very gentle. It's very soft and small and delicate. Um, so I wrote just in my own handwriting and I s did a back stitch over the top. So it's very messy, you can see. Um, and I wrote on it to my MP, as my MP, which is my local politician, I'm asking you to please use your powerful position to challenge injustices, change structures keeping people poor and fight for a more just and fair world. I know being an MP is a tough and big job, but please don't blow it in capital letters so she understood the hanky link. This is your chance to make a real positive difference, smiley face. Yours in hope, Sarah, with my surname and my postcode so she knew I was a constituent. And I made it and I asked to meet her, which I knew she had to do because she was my local MP. And I didn't go in with a brief and paper from a charity saying, I think this and you should sign this now and just treat her like a robot. I went and said, Jane, I've made you this. I want to show that I genuinely care and I'm sorry that I was just sending you stuff and not asking you questions. I want to know why you're an MP. I gave her a big smile. I gave it to her and she immediately looked completely bemused and a little bit confused um, and looked at it and touched it and looked how messy it was on the back, which my grandmother would not be happy with. I've got lots to learn. Um, and she opened up to me much more than, you know, I worked as a lobbyist for different charities, much more than any politician had in the past because it was very gentle. It was very respectful. It was saying, let's be critical friends to each other rather than aggressive enemies. I asked her why she was an MP. She said she used to work for a cooperative, which I always use now in every conversation I had with her. I talk about how good cooperatives are. You know, Jane, you used to work for one, how good the living wage is. You know it works because you can see it in business work. And so it was a sneaky way, but a respectful way to try and be on the level and connect with her with a common cause. And then when we did disagree, I could say, just explain to me why you think that. I might change my mind if you explain it clearly to me. I'm up for being open and learning and challenging each other where we can. And after that meeting, she would engage me in different campaigns that she needed help with, that we agreed with. I could challenge her on stuff and she would be much more open with me. I could, the information she told me, I could send to NGOs that would find it really useful to know her personal views and her political standpoint on certain things, because they always want that data. But it was a much cleverer way to campaign than just shouting at each other. It was slower, but that gentleness sort of, killing people with kindness, but in a very respectful way. It made me a much better local lobbyist and made me understand politics much more as well. Um, and leading on from that, you know, all of my work is very small and um, very delicate. So you have to look into it. Um, so I was really passionate to make activism intriguing rather than, you know, you can see hopefully, that my methodology has really come out of a reaction to activism rather than out of a, 
I do love craft, but I try and not have that steer me in a direction because I don't think that's the, the best priority. So it's always seeing where craft could be a useful reaction to activism that might be not might not be the most effective at certain times. So I always talk about craftivism should be part of the activism toolkit and not replace all activism because sadly craftivism isn't going to save the world as much as we might want it to um but i wanted craftivism to be intrigue and activism so i started doing these mini protest banners which again are this size so you can see these ones and it was a reaction to activism where you'd see giant banners that would say in capital letters we want this or don't do this exclamation mark and I don't know about you, but I don't like being told what to do. So if I see this thing that I haven't um, asked to see, it feels very intrusive. It feels very shouty. And I don't engage with it because I haven't decided to engage with it. So it feels quite aggressive. S and I felt like activism should be threads throughout our lives. It should be in places where we might not see it because we do need to be reminded to think about the world and think about others and connect with whether we are being helpful or harmful to the planet and to people. So I started doing these mini protest banners because the cross stitch was very repetitive. So I could think very deeply about what I was stitching and why, what the issue was about, who I wanted to engage with and how I wanted to engage with them where I was going to put it, what I was going to write online about it with different hyperlinks for people to find if they googled my little label. I would think about all of the different levels of how it could be a useful tool in activism and then I would put it up and hope, my hope was that people would notice it, but it was always off eye level. So all of my street art isn't in your face. It's not big. It's not on eye level saying, look at me. It's somewhere hidden. So it might be below or above. There might be sequins on it. So when it wafts in the wind, you can see a little sparkle and you go, well, what, what's that? It's always handmade. So it's very unique. And you can see that someone spent a long time making it. So that, and because it's soft and it's craft, it's not, you know, a, a poster or a piece of card or anything brash it was about enticing people in to go what's that and as soon as they take the initiative to decide to look into it then you sort of they're much more open to hear what you're saying than if you're screaming at people so my little banners i was hoping it would provoke people rather than rather than preach at them i was hoping people would maybe google it to find out more information online and i started doing it on my own in august 2008 now which is a long time ago um and it did people started looking at things online um but more than that it made people also connect with each other online <coughs> <coughs> so we can see it on the next slide is i didn't plan for this at all or this <laughs> um when i started doing it but because it was very intriguing not only were people connecting with it online but media started contacting me which i never contact the media because it makes me uncomfortable and it feels a little bit um yeah i just don't like pushing it at all i like it to be more organic but people started contacting me saying these images you know that we might have seen them in public or the high res resolution images and i'd make sure i had really good photographs was something that w that people wanted to share in magazines as good images all of my mini protest banners and my other work is always as timeless as possible um if it's facts they're always as rele they're always true facts and relevant to a particular time but they're always ones that are relevant to as many people around the world as possible so it's universal um and can people can connect to in different places but they might target you know if i'm doing stuff outside top shop i'm focusing on fashionistas if i'm doing stuff in the bank and um sector then i'm you know trying to engage with with bankers and businessmen in those physical locations but what i found was people resonated massively with it so people saw it as a beautiful image that they could share with people without their friends rolling their eyes and saying oh this is so depressing don't engage me with it or them feeling like they were preaching to their friends they could just say i've seen this what do you think without feeling like they had to know all of the answers. So there was different reasons why it spread. I think one, it was because the images were good online. One, because it, in the physical location, it was a very odd thing to see. You wouldn't see it as much. You might see it a little bit more now, but you didn't at all five to three years ago. 
media really liked it because it was high res images and it wasn't party political and it wasn't political with a big P. So they didn't feel like they had to make a stand. They could do a huge feature on it without saying, we believe this and annoying their advertisers. So it was quite a sneaky way of trying to be in a position where other forms of activism couldn't be. And that's, for me, you know, a real priority is where can't activism get and where do I think craft could be a really useful tool. And it also meant that introvert people like myself or crafty people could see that they could do activism that wasn't just marching or signing petitions or angry or masculine activism, they could say, oh, I could maybe do that, or I hadn't thought of activism in that way, and we should see it in as many different ways as possible. So it was very intriguing, um, and it was very provocative rather than preaching at people. We're near the end. This number four out of five is quiet activism. So again, when I was doing the craftivism, I was, it was a reaction to really loud activism, and I think, Activism, sometimes it's really powerful, you know, to have your voice heard, to say chants together and feel part of a big movement and feel in solidarity with each other and see it online with people marching at the same time all over the world. I think it's amazing and it can make um, a big difference and it can definitely put the wind up a lot of business people and politicians and wake them up to think, oh, we should probably do something on this. But I was also concerned that it wasn't engaging people, like I said, on a deep level. It was people walking past. I would walk past people with megaphones and placards because it was aggressive. I might be tired and busy at the time. I didn't want to be tr you know, shouted out or told I was an awful person for not joining the march or being told you know, by a very passionate person, you should do this, this and this, but there was no conversation. I wanted conversation with people. And I started crafting on, pub on public transport, one, because I was traveling a lot with work, but also because I wanted to see if it would cause conversations because I knew it was very odd you know now it's not so odd to knit like this but four or five years ago in the UK you wouldn't do it you wouldn't see many knitters and you definitely wouldn't see young people knitting or cross stitching so I would be cross stitching on trains to pass the time but also to think about these issues and people naturally would have a little look and go and I might give them a little smile, but I would never go, do you want to ask me what I'm doing? Or let's have a chat. I would give them a little smile. And then if they decided to ask me what I was doing, I could say, oh, I'm stitching this quote about inequality. What do you think? What would you put on it? And because I was responding with a question as well, and with a smile in a gentle way, hopefully, in an encouraging way, it was it was a little bit, you know, challenging people, but in a nice way, because it was small, it wasn't big, it wasn't about me and my ego, it was about me thinking about this and seeing if other people thought about it. And was being very honest with each other about these things are so complicated and how do we make a change and isn't it hard to feel empowered when everything feels so large and really have these conversations about what we could do and what sometimes we might not be able to do. And because my background's in, community development and global development, I could facilitate a bit more maybe than um, people who might not have known that much about development or global campaigning. So I could sort of facilitate those one-on-ones, but without people feeling like I was facilitating them. But it was a real eye-opener to see that people, even in London, where no one gives each other eye contact, especially on the underground tube stations, people were asking me what I was doing. And I was having these incredible conversations for you know a long time with ex-bankers, with teachers, with single parents, all about some of these things I was stitching and then I was asking them issues and they would open up because it was a very delicate, quiet thing to do or because when we craft in public <laughs> together, you don't need eye contact. So I've worked a lot with neuroscientists and clinicians at Falmouth University about why is craft an incredible tool for people to bond and to people to open up and with their own mental health and well-being. And eye contact is so unique to craft, um, where you can be in a group where you don't have to look at each other, so people do open up much more. Where you're in a group where things do take hours, so you can listen while you're stitching, and you don't feel like you've got to say anything. Or there can be si silence, where there's no awkward silence. You know, Most activist groups I joined outside of work, as well as in my job, 
you'd all just be sitting there in a big table and it would be awkward if people didn't say anything and it would be uncomfortable and you'd have to be quite confident to speak to each other. But craft made it quieter, made it so that people didn't have to give eye contact and it also made people be intrigued to ask us what we're doing. So in my little book, it's got lots of top tips and it, one of them is if you're going to do a stitching, which is what we call our little public stitching, um, sit-ins really, we call them stitchings. I always say don't do it more than 10 people because you don't want to intimidate people where there's 50 of you in a room because no one's going to ask you things because you're, you know, you're taking up a lot of space and it can be quite intimidating. Whereas if you're in public with less than 10 people and you've got cups of tea and biscuits and you're chatting to each other or you're in silence because sometimes you don't need to talk to each other, people are more likely to smile and ask you what you're doing than if you were standing there with a placard looking really angry. So I wanted that element of activism to be there that was quiet to counteract the loudness. Um, this last image is in the Haywood Gallery, which is in the South Bank, because I was asked to do an uh, event that was part of the Tracy Emin retrospective exhibition a couple of years ago. And because it was quiet activism and because um, people yeah, a few years ago knew that we were doing this quiet, gentle activism that was engaging crafters and creative people in a different way and activists in a non-burnout way. We ended up with 70 people and often it was people coming on their own who would tweet beforehand, I'm going to go to the Tracy Emin exhibition because I love quilts or for whatever reason, but I'm particularly going to go on this date because the Craftivist Collective are going to be there and I want to go along to their event afterwards. So we got 70 people, often who came on their own who were introverted, who knew that we'd have cushions, who knew that they didn't have to talk to people if they didn't want to, but also knew that we always have lots of volunteers to help each other if, if people need help. And I was really proud at that moment because I didn't do much advertising because it makes me uncomfortable. Um, I was really proud that people felt comfortable and welcome enough to be able to come in a very quiet way and people who were nervous of activism could have us as a stepping stone into activism in a gentle way. Um, and I felt like without the craft, without the handicraft, it would have been really hard to do that. Um, and again, one quote from a craftivist from Reading said, one of the wonderful things about having a stitch in in such a public place, not only the conversations we had amongst ourselves, but also being able to talk about the projects to other people. And she moved to Reading, an area in the UK where she didn't know anyone. She liked craft and she wanted to meet like-minded people. So I helped her set up an event in a local cafe, again, just for a small amount of people. And it went really well because she she just invited people and if there was two people it was fine if there was 10 people it was great but it was a lovely way to engage the local cafe and what she was doing and build a relationship with them um, but also to yet slowly see if there was a group of people that could support each other and I think because it was quiet as well it means that I do get to work with incredible organizations where my last job was with Oxfam, which in the UK has got the largest brand identity for a charity in the UK. It's one of the biggest charities and the most well recognized. But even though we had that weight behind us, we couldn't work with a lot of these people because it was too political and not holistic, because activism is seen as a dirty word in many ways and seen as a scary thing. Whereas again, without me asking, I was having the V&A saying, would you come and do some workshops with us and could you make it link into our exhibitions? So some of our activism is very specific on sweatshops or on a particular issue, but a lot of them are much more holistic, like the footprints about how to be a good global citizen or linking to exhibitions about um, asylum seekers or about homelessness or just about creativity being used to give a voice. We'll link that in with activism and social injustice, but in a very slow, holistic way, which is much more attractive for art institutions, especially. And it also let me you know, do lectures for Parsons New School. And I was in um, Stockholm a few weeks ago at the Beckman's College of Design 
um, speak, doing an open lecture, but with lots of design students. So make an activism as relevant as possible to these different audiences um, without working for a charity. Again, because the craft was involved, it made these doors open much more than if I still worked for Oxfam. And luckily it made me be able to go part time in my job because I was getting lots of work and then go full time. And now touch wood, just about surviving um, ish. But it really opened these doors because it was holistic, because it was craft, because it was quiet and because it was slow and gentle. Um, and I don't think that I would have been able to work with these in other ways. <coughs> so the final one is that for me, activism isn't always joyful. Um, I'm struggling with this word joyful, um, which I don't know whether you are more because you're Finnish and I don't know if there's a similar thing, but I, I don't want activism to be really depressing, but I also don't want it to be fun. And there's a real balance there. So I joined lots of activist groups when um, I moved to London for a particular job. And I noticed that either I didn't fit in because a lot were very depressed or lots were very angry or lots of people cycled and I'm too scared to ride a bike or I felt like loving fashion I wasn't allowed to in some activist groups it was you know you're not allowed to read Vogue how dare you read Vogue you know you have to be very purist and very angry activism and one that bends people out or you end up with the same groups the same type of people and I think we should all be activists in different ways and I think we need to strive for having a brilliant world rather than wallow on how awful it is and psychology says the same so you would never see an advert by a company <coughs> saying don't do this I mean imagine think about it now there aren't any companies that say don't do that they all say do you want to be like this our product will help you do it do you want this yet charities always say no fracking, no to this, no to that, which is really short term thinking. Our psychology is that, so I love chocolate too much. I have about three bars of chocolate a day, which is awful, and I'm trying to lessen it. And I have to tell myself not don't eat chocolate because your brain doesn't understand don't, it understands chocolate. And then it thinks of, oh what, chocolate. <laughs> I have to tell myself I'm going to be really healthy or I am really healthy. And then your brain naturally figures out how to get there which doesn't include chocolate. So I found it really frustrating that if we wanted a very healthy environment with less pollution um, and we wanted no sweatshops, for example, um, we focus on the sweatshops rather than focus on how do we want this beautiful world and how do we get there? So for me, to be a sustainable activist and to be hopeful and excited about how more beautiful the world could be, um, I wanted to look at, have that goal in mind rather than get really depressed about something and then just go, this is no fun. I, I'm feeling really depressed and no one's going to engage in activism if you're you know, sitting there gloomy and looking angry. You want it to be attractive. So one, the color of craft, I always use colors like yellow. You can see in all of these images as hopeful colors as possible. So it attracts people in and it's as hopeful as possible. Um, but I don't want it to be fun where people use it as an excuse. So, you know, I do love craft and I could slip into saying, I'll just do everything through craft because I love craft. And I have to challenge myself to say, am I actually doing craft because I'm serving <coughs> people and I'm making the world a better place? Or am I doing it because it makes me feel better and it's a nice excuse to use it and say it's for good? Um, and th because my craftivism is trying to be hopeful and exciting and encouraging, it means we can ask each other those difficult questions, but still with inspiration in mind of we want the world to be like this. Um, and again, I've got a lovely quote from a craftivist who w runs a mother's group. And I love her quote. It was a project we did with Save the Children. And she said, I love the project. It's really inspiring and creative and has really got me excited about activism again in a way I haven't been since my teens. Thank you. And that's a recurring theme. I get lots of lovely emails from people or responses from workshops saying, I did do lots of activism while I was at university or when I was younger, but then I didn't see any change and I got really depressed or I have a mortgage and children and a job to think about, so I can't do all of that. Um, and people saw it as a negative thing and a chore and something that we have to do rather than something that we should do and that we're excited about. And I'm really passionate about trying to say, 
the world has got some brilliant things in it. Just let's make it better. We can do. We've seen in the past that things have changed massively for the better. We can still do it and really getting people excited. So when they leave our workshops or when they do our kits, people go, yeah, I could do this and I want to do more of it. And then their friends start getting involved. And again, you know, that means that we have lots of people all over the world doing our projects regularly because it is something that's not fun, but it's fulfilling. You know, it's something that they feel really proud that they've achieved because it's not easy and quick but it's not too difficult so it's always trying to get this balance right in all of these different ways which can make my brain go a little bit crazy and exhausted but I think we need to think about all these details um, so that's the other one I wanted it to be really as hopeful as possible um, and that ended up meaning that, yeah, people around the world wanted to join in. So now we have kits that people can do and instruction videos online. And we have the little book that people aren't buying the book as a chore to read. They're actually excited. You know, I was really um, quite stubborn with the book with my editor. I said I wanted to make sure it's cheap enough that anyone could buy it, that it's small enough to fit in a Christmas stocking or as a small gift for someone um, <coughs> that wouldn't be something saying, you're horrible, you need this book to change. But saying, isn't this quite fun? Um, I had, Ru you know, Russell Brand, the comedian? Yeah, he came to uh, my last workshop at the V&A with his mother, which was really lovely. And he was really, really nice guy and really thoughtful and really liked the kit and got quite excited about it. Um, and I gave him the book and I said what I say to everyone, forgetting that it was Russell Brand. I said, oh, make sure you put it in your on the top of your toilet seat so people can read it while they're having a poo. And he looked at me and went, that's a very odd thing to say. And I went, yeah, it is. But while people are sitting there, they could have a little flick through it, see all of these images, because there's not too much text in it. And they may come out and say, I just read this little book. And it is those conversation starters. And he agreed. And I'm hoping it, the book might be in his toilet, in his bathroom. But who knows? Maybe he could tell us. But it is about having these small things. It's not about me wanting to do a big book to make me look good, but doing a small thing that's as useful as possible. And I really want to be as useful as possible in the world while I'm on this world. Um, and these ways, it means that we get activism into shops like gallery shops and craft shops where you wouldn't normally see activism but it's in hopefully it's in a beautiful exciting intriguing way that gets people thinking but on their own terms rather than being preached at so they're my five points really it's inner activism it's gentle activism it's intrigue and activism quiet activism and joyful activism. And if you have a better word for joyful, let me know, because I'm still not sure whether that fits it. So thank you so much for listening. I can't keep us, I can't do it, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Can you try again? <laughs> I'm going to try, so don't, don't laugh. We practice kitos on the train, but the, the next word and I is can't very say long. So I say kitos or kidos, and I can't get the bit in the middle. And then mi milen kinos dani. No, <laughs> I'm a bit dyslexic as well, so <laughs> it is quite hard. <laughs> but thanks good. for listening. Thank you. Now um, we'll have that conversation that yeah. we talked about. Um, I'm not sure how um, critical it'll be, um, but you can ask me tough questions. I like yeah, tough I questions. I, I so know you've said you can. You can be tough on me. Yeah, I was. I was making notes that you, you are with the MP now, a critical friend and not an enemy. Uh, not uh, an aggressive enemy. Not yeah. an aggressive enemy. Or an enemy. I don't think we should have enemies. No, no, we should work together. So um, we'll have a conversation. Maybe it's not that critical, but uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll do some Let's of the tough ones. Yes. Now, um, if you Google craftivism, mm -hmm. uh, which is craft and activism together, you, you can come to something that looks like yarn bombing. Mm -hmm. um, Make do and mend and donates and donations of yeah. um, as, you know crafty things. Um, you mentioned a little bit in in your talk already about this, but it appears that um, you don't do that. I don't. And why is it? I normally get people going, "Oh, you do yarn bombing." I have to go, "No, we don't." Um, 
I think, you know, like I've said, for me, I, I Googled. So I first got in, I first heard about the word craftivism because as a typical millennial, I Googled craft activism because I thought these were just perfect combination. And this word popped up. Um, that Betsy Greer coined in 2003. So I immediately went on her website thinking, brilliant, of course other people are going to be doing it. Um, this is a really good thing to do. And I noticed a lot of, she would document how craft had been used in the past, in history, sometimes for activism, like the suffragettes used it incredibly well. Um, and Chilean women used it in these um, small appliques for under the Pinochet dictatorship. But there wasn't much going on, so I asked if there were any projects or groups I could join, and she said there wasn't, and she let me use the term. Um, but for me, you know, the activism, activism isn't, if you look at the definition, it isn't donation, it isn't fundraising. When I work for large charities, we have different departments who do that. And when we work with the public, we say we need donation for emergency relief, but if we don't do that alongside campaigning and alongside development with partners and with beneficiaries, then it's not healthy and it's not actually good development, whether we want it to be or not. Um, so I find it really hard. Betsy says anything can be craftivism and it's her word. So I'm in a strange place where I'm using Betsy's word, but I'm using it for activism, using craft not for donation or a, um, a w not even awareness raising really if i'm making people aware of something i'm always trying to provoke them to take action rather than just be aware of something um so and i do struggle i mean i'm from a very low income area where we would have people come in to save us you know we would have people come in to say you need help have my shoes that my child has grown out of and the families in our area would still say, I don't want your shoes. I want to be able to afford my own shoes for my family. And what's stopping that isn't my hard work or my laziness or my lack of skill. It's structures that mean I don't have a living wage or there isn't a good welfare state to help me help myself. So I'm probably oversensitive, but I think that's good to say we don't want people to just give them your shoes and go, I've done my good deed. I really want people to grapple with where these problems come from and all of the complexities of it and i worry a lot and because i've been to i used to, i've worked in ghana and kenya um only for a, a few weeks and months at each but for charities for ngos where we've worked with partners i know how skilled these partners are and how they know their area more than anyone else so for us to tell them what to do is just I just think it's really unhealthy and really undignified. So I get, I get very worried when people just, it's easy in some ways to donate and sometimes that's needed. But if you just stop with that, I think it's really harmful. And I yarn bombing, I think it can be really beautiful, but I really struggle to see what the activism message is. And it can be a bit too ambiguous. So although I try and make my craftivism intriguing and provocative rather than preaching, I still always try and make it clear that it's about activism, whether it's when you Google it or whether it's the actual text itself um, or whether it's the process is very much about activism. But yeah, I. I'm in a strange place with craftivism because it's not my word and people do. It's a bit, I always say it's a bit like punk. You know the word punk? So some journalists came up with the word punk, but under punk you've got Blondie, <coughs> Talking Heads, the Ramones, and then you have The Clash and The Sex Pistols. And they're all so different, completely different, but they're all called punk. So I always feel like craftivism is a bit like that. But I do worry that it's, it's more comfortable doing non-activism. It's more comfortable, it's more tangible to give money and to say, look what I've achieved, rather than to look at the messiness. And I really want us to look at the messiness. And I'm asking a lot of people, but I think we need to look at, look much deeper into our role and what we do and educate ourselves a bit more. So I do, yeah, I do really want to push what activism is and I don't want it to be diluted as a term that people just go, oh, that's fundraising. When activism isn't fundraising, it's a completely different thing. Does that make sense?
I think so. It's a, but it's a mm-hmm. it's a strange place to be, and it, I don't want to tell anyone they're wrong. Be. But <laughs> I do think we need to we need to look at all of the issues. And some of my projects work, and sometimes they don't. And there's lots of flaws and potential weaknesses because people bring different things to them. So there's a yeah, it's not a, a quick fix or an easy thing to do because it is about transformation and not a transaction. So it's always going to be a bit fuzzy, fuzzy. And messy, and but then messy. you make it gentle. I think it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, gently challenge each other. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about <coughs> Finland being a bit more equal uh, yeah. um, in terms of social justice, and it is is striking to hear about your background and where you lived in Everton mm. and um, where you grew up, and you even mentioned that it is. It has some characteristics or some aspects that almost uh, we would think is from Africa oh, or, yeah. or or things mm. like that. Could you could you talk a little bit more about how in the global north we can have areas or we ha- we can have mm. uh, places where it is almost as um, <coughs> deprived yeah. as in Africa or. Yeah, I think we like to think, well, in, um, from the UK, so we'll focus on the UK, we like to think we're not that bad um, because we hide it very well and we talk about success stories and, you know, being able to reach your potential and become a celebrity or an X Factor winner and all of that stuff. My big worry now is where is in the 80s people, you know, we have a we have a very defined class system which is getting less defined but it's still there which i don't think you from what i've understood you don't have as clear as we have a working class and you know a middle class or upper class which there's a little bit of movement around there but not a huge amount still sadly um and in the 80s people would go on marches so we had minor strikes and um the dockers in liverpool was a big thing now people just don't want to put their heads above the parapets because we've demonized poor people so much and we call them poor people which we shouldn't as well as these des- undeserving poor who are lazy mm. but i i mean we live in a very and in the world in general in a very capitalist society which is hugely i ideological and dogmatic that you know there's so much evidence now of how inequality means that you know, the more unequal society is, the more conflict, um, the more bad health, you know, it really just causes so much toxic, um, yeah, elements to it. But we still really focus on capitalism and business is the way that we do things. Um, and that means that, yeah, the people, if we don't have a welfare system, people just fall through the net and other people just don't want to engage with them. And more so now I think we're so fueled with individualism because of selfies being how many people like my face or adverts being about how pretty you look is what you're divine you're defined in and in the UK that means that it's very selfish really and it's not cool to care about someone else and it, if you challenge people we've got again more so now I think people aren't as critical as they might have used used to be where you could say hang on a minute is that really good or are you just being a bit selfish there you can't do that so much now but i think when you have an extreme capitalist society i'm not saying all capitalism is wrong and i'm not saying communism the answer is the answer i see myself as a socialist and very much so but i think when you put pre profit over people Mm. you're always going to get people slipping under the net and Finland what I've heard from our chats you know late at night just with the maternity boxes you have where everyone you know and you very much still have that ethos of everyone is born equal we don't have that so much in the UK and it's not challenged because it's very much seen as you make you know the dream you want to be and if you can do it well done and if you can't it's your fault Mm. because we don't critique things you know we don't really grapple with stuff which means you know in the UK because of the cuts now we have even more children who are um, malnutritioned we have ev- we have more and more food banks popping up all over the country because people can't afford to eat and the most people who can't afford to eat are people who have jobs so it's not that they don't have a job it's that their job doesn't pay them enough money so it's just this crazy situation which 
people don't want to engage with. Mm. And, you know, I do it where I'll read the paper and something depressing is in there and you think, I'm feeling a bit, you know, delicate anyway. I don't want to read it. And you just turn over. And sometimes if we're in a privileged position, like I am being here, it's easy to ignore that side because we live in such a global um, world. You can so you don't have to know your neighbours as much mm. as you did have to. But, yeah, when... In the 80s, when I grew up under Thatcher, it was very much business is best, very right wing, and sadly that's what's happening again. And the nanny state issue, um, it's, yeah, it's a really toxic culture that we need to challenge, but it means challenging ourselves, which we avoid, because mm. we're human. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we avoid, and then there are people who, mm. who do a lot about it. Um, you worked both professionally for the NGOs, mm -hmm. um, and if we talk a little bit about the Global South, uh, you've um, you've been with an NGO to Ghana, for example, yeah. and this, and and then okay, you've yeah. taken your craftivism to was it Indonesia? How would you mm. compare and contrast those experiences? Like, yeah, I mean, we so my methodology to craftivism is very much um, for you know, it was a reaction to UK and some more global North countries and how we work there. So my trip to Indonesia with, with a project I did with Save the Children, who we hosted the G20 a couple of years ago in the UK. So Cameron was the, the chair and the host. So we had more influence in steering those debates and those agendas. So lots of the NGOs came together in a coalition about food, the food industry and how harmful it was um, in terms of taxes, in terms of land grabs and linking it with climate change and all of these elements that they wanted as the top of the agenda and for um, Western countries to up their aid to say we need more aid for, for the global south. So I was asked by the save the children to engage the craft community one because i'm part of the craft community and they didn't know so many crafters and also because i've got a campaign and background so i sort of fit strangely in the middle um they as part of the project i took four of our like biggest craft celebrities in the uk <laughs> so craft bloggers and um yeah craft celebrities to indonesia to to see the work that save the children were doing there um that was linked in with malnutrition children and linked in with hunger issues um so it wasn't about doing craftivism there but it was about bringing some of the craft community to see the work that save the children were doing understand the unjust food system that we were living in speak to lots of beneficiaries and partners about how they'd worked with Save the Children to try and tackle some of these issues of hunger so we could come back and tell those stories to the craft community. Um, but it was also interesting because I went as a craftivist, so the community was saying, tell me about your work. So I was, you know, prioritising getting their story, but I would tell them a bit of our story as well. And it was lovely. I mean, and the same with I did a mini protest banner outside Topshop on one of the slides about... Kate Moss getting three million pounds to endorse a uh, top shop line um, and Mauritian factories workers getting 21p an hour. And my mum met um, the, my dad's a local vicar. My mum met the bishop of, uh, the bishop's wife who's Mauritian and then, um, and she was talking about inequality there. So my mum gave one of my postcards, which was this image, to the bishop's wife and said, we thought we, you might like this, it's just a little gift. And she said that that touched them much more than getting clothes shipped to them or money shipped to them. To know that solidarity of people making time that they don't have to, to engage with these issues, to empathise with each other, to be in solidarity, to say we want everyone to have the respect and dignity they deserve and the pay that they deserve. And that was the same thing in Indonesia. People were touching what we had and being excited about touching them and sharing them and seeing the images and found it quite funny, you know, and quite unusual um, and wanted to hear the response we had from people. And they were really proud that we were having these conversations about stuff that they were saying that we didn't need to have conversations about. So they were saying, thank you so much for bringing this, bringing our stories back, which we said we would but also having these conversations that you don't need to you know it really made them feel much more 
empowered than I think if I brought a bag of clothes, which I know I wouldn't, I'd just feel really embarrassed. It's like, you know, when you need to, if I ever need money, if I'm skint and I have to say to my mum, can I borrow some money? You know, it doesn't feel empowering. You don't feel dignified. pride and dignified. So it was really, it, it made me keep going as well because I do constantly worry about whether people see craftivism as a easy form of activism or a get out clause or is it making any difference because it's hard to measure because it's about hearts and minds rather than political policy sometimes so to hear people saying yeah keep doing it mm. and there was a, a women's group that would make clothes they all had sing old singer sewing machines you know with the old pedals beautiful machines and they were really proud to show us their clothes they were making as well so there's a real connection there because we both so and we had one man mr x stitch who's a, a famous cr cross stitching person so and he's a very big guy with a bald head it's quite fun so they were all laughing you know lots of the women were laughing at jamie mr x stitch because they just thought it was brilliant that this big man was doing cross stitch that they were doing as well it was it was a lovely yeah solidarity and just a common cause rather than us and them <coughs> which makes me concerned so the, the traditional form of um, activism or uh, campaigning you felt more uh, us and them and I, yeah yeah sometimes i think yeah there's still lots of forms mm. of i think shareholder activism is the most exciting at the moment about you could you know buy a share in tesco is a big um supermarket in the uk i don't know if you've heard of it they're awful in the uk to their farmers to land grabs to their staff um you can buy a share for one pound go to their agm meeting and vote on what you want and it's so powerful so there's really interesting activism happening but we could slip into i feel good by saving those people and we have to challenge that mm. you know we don't all do that sometimes but if we can slip into that you know I know my sister's really good at being honest with me if I look awful in a pair of pants and she'll also challenge me if I'm getting a bit, you know, big for my boots. So I make sure she's around me a lot to keep challenging me. I'll challenge you now with a question. Uh, when is the campaign won? And what does that mean? And, and will not the losers just fight back harder? Yeah, and, um, good question. And how do you measure the effects of mm. of activism yeah so i get asked a lot by journalists what campaigns have you won because they want quick answers and i can't say any of them but i also think no one can say any of them because it's really hard to measure campaigns it's easy to measure the number of signatures or the num amount of money and things but that doesn't change that doesn't mean we can change people's hearts and minds with it and if you, again if you look throughout history um you know the suffragettes lots of people say won the vote for women in the uk um and some people might say it's because they smashed windows with hammers which some of them did some of them say it's because it was upper class women making jam and that was engaging people so they all had lots of different methods so even when you say the suffragettes got the vote it's not you, you're trying to figure out how that worked. But also people will say women got the votes because after World War I, women had really proved themselves of holding the country together when the men went to war. And that was the tipping point. So it's, I think it's always a massive mix. So, you know, I will look throughout history and learn a lot from Martin Luther King and Gandhi, as well as, you know, Rosa Parks, the massive introvert and, um, uh, Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, all of these different people doing incredible things, but you couldn't say they won a campaign. It's, you know, it, it's not that simplistic and it's not easy to measure. So that's why I think we need to come at it at all angles, which is why I say craftivism could be useful sometimes at particular times, but we also need to come at it at different angles. So you can never win a campaign and i used to when i worked for oxfam we'd constantly be very competitive and say we won that campaign and unless it was just oxfam working directly with a particular company um you couldn't really say that it was often change in wind it was change in attitudes it might be a spark like um the 
occupy movement spark things off but you can't say whether that won it or not so it's really hard to claim that and i don't think we should claim it because i think if as soon as we try and win things and then it's about us rather than about solidarity and the same that sort of links in with winners and losers so i really don't like the language we use about we're going to win this and we have an enemy here and we're right here because we know on one-to-one -one or as groups or tribes that if you say we're going to win this and you're the loser then if anything you're not changing the loser's mind you're getting them even more passionate and stronger to fight back so i just find that really worrying so you know we have lots of wars now and they don't sometimes there's you know key points where violence might help something short term but i think if we want long-term change of helping people's hearts and minds change, then you you can't have winners and losers because you're just suppressing people and other people rising up and it's just gonna cause more and more tension and it makes no sense. I just think it makes no sense, common sense at all. Mm. I find it really strange and frustrating that we, we do these very simplistic solutions that if we delved into them, we know they're not right. And you wanted, um, we were talking a little bit about distraction and white noise mm. and what things should reach the news and what not. And, mm. and you also talked, you are extremely uh, thoughtful and strategic about what you do, how you do it, when you do it, and whether you are the right person to do it. And that they are, there are lots of things that you think that you shouldn't be doing or you shouldn't be doing in one way or another and would you like to talk a little bit about that yeah i mean i think again we all need to be intentional on what we do and who we are so i am clearly a white woman so in some situations i'll be a, you know a good person to be there in other situations i won't so um i was lucky just after mandela got out in 95 my my dad's a vicar which means every seven years they're supposed to have three months off or longer to go and see other forms of um, being a, a Christian vicar and then bring that back to your work and sort of refresh yourself a bit and lots of companies do it really well. Um, he's only have, ever had one sabbatical because he works too hard and he's got a lot of work to do in the area that he still lives with my mum. And we went to South Africa so we went just after Mandela got out, so extremely tense, still very violent, and we went around different areas to see um, what different church groups were doing on apartheid, both um, black and white, and you know mixed groups as well. And I, we were all very aware, and my parents, again, probably overly sensitive, but I think that's right, that they were, they were white and they were from England. So we were trying to come along, I was eight, we were trying to go and just watch and learn and ask questions and see what was, and there's lots of parallel poverty and parallel violence that was happening in Liverpool, our area in, in Everton is, you know, no one wants to live in Everton, you're really labelled as you're never going to be anything. It's a really really awful when there's incredible people living there um so we were seeing these parallels and what was happening um but it was also really tense so we would go to townships where my mum would give us um color and paper and pens because we'd go to a church service that would be three hours long <laughs> and we'd be bored as you know eight-year-olds and um we'd have all these colored pens and you suddenly get all of these kids wanting to color in with you. So we were sharing out the pens and everything, but it felt there was not, it wasn't equal balance at all. But at the same time, like in Indonesia, people were going, this is really good. You need to bring this story back. And they knew that we were trying to learn for our own inequality and our own poverty in the UK as well. Um, I know in the craft community that I'm better positioned because I love craft than someone who doesn't love craft that tries to jump in and take part in the craft community from an NGO. You know, you can you can smell it, can't you, when people are trying to get something from you and they're not on the level. But I also know that if I, you know, went to Brixton where there's a massive um, Caribbean community and tried to work with them, I would have to do it in a very slow way to build trust with people, but I wouldn't be the right person to do it as well. I work a lot with interfaith groups in one of my jobs and I would say to my boss 
very firmly if you want me to work um, with this Muslim group or with this Jewish group I'm a, a Christian woman and I'm going to say that when I arrive and I'm going to say do you want to work with me or not and this is what we're thinking but what do you want and let's make it you know a real negotiation and it will take months and they would often want you know an event in two weeks that lots of people would go to and I'd have to say no that's really not respectful me coming in going everyone should join this campaign so I, I and I also know where my flaws are you know I know I'm my sister's got incredible skill in social work with young foster carers um, and young people on the edge of prison or in and out of prison I could never do that job she's incredible at it I'd I just don't I'd just be absolutely awful at it I'm she's an extrovert and I'm an introvert that's one part of it my mum's a politician now because she can read these massive reports and she loves reading these massive reports and figuring out things and her brain works in completely different ways to mine so she's brilliant at that but again I can't do that so I'm always thinking what am I good at or what could I learn more about what drains me of energy so sustainably in terms of personal sustainability what can I do that's positive that keeps me going that I'm good at or I can learn to be good at and also we were say I often say to people you know if someone was doing what I'm doing much better than me I wouldn't do it you know I would say brilliant you should you know if someone said what should I do in terms of craftivism I'd say well they're doing it brilliantly so I'd go and find another reason to be useful in a different part but it is yeah it's constant critiquing of where am I best where do I best fit? And we were talking about, you know, what project am I doing now and how does it come about? Again, I'm not very good at asking about proactively saying I want to do this project with organisations, but I s tend to say no more than yes. So I'll get lots offered and I'm very strict on saying, does this fit the craftivist community? Do we have enough time and energy to do it well? Does it fit with our methodology? Um, do I like the people who are asking us to engage with or do I not feel like we agree completely? So I'm really strict on trying to do something that I know we could do well rather than do it badly <laughs> or I'll bring in other people to help us so often with particular <laughs> campaigns we will work with particular NGOs that really know the policy detail and know a lot of the facts or work with people on the ground affected so we can get all of that information and then see where we're best fitted and I will always ask the, the NGO we're working with where does our strength lie and where doesn't it you know so with the craft community they might say we need politicians to see that it's not just hardcore activists who care about this issue we need to show that other people do often it's not we need lots of money to send clothes overseas that's not tends tends not to be what they want so we yeah don't do that now you're uh, quite famous in the um in this field, but so is your case, your lovely case that you brought us. Would which you like to show a little bit what you've it's got there? It's falling apart. It's my what's the kit? It's my great aunt's. Um, it's a few years old. When she passed away, and we had to empty her house, and I found this beautiful case. And she used to work for the Red Cross, and she went to Indonesia. Um, really pioneering woman. It was a single woman her whole life um, after the war because she lost her partner in the war. But the most feistiest woman, and she was an anthropologist, so working in, in um, tribes where other women, white women, wouldn't. I mean, amazing woman. So I quite like the fact that I'm using her suitcase and I think she'd approve of it. But it's completely fallen apart because it went to six festivals this summer around the UK in the the floods as well so there's massive holes in it but i i carry this around because one i have to carry lots around with me but i also like we were talking about the public space and um, i thought it would be more enticing to be a pop-up craftivist because i use lots of social media so i use it as a hashtag and i put it on foursquare and swarm for people to see where i am and then people pop up from nowhere and it's got a little quote inside which is hopeful she's a bit old and dirty now it's margaret mead it says never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world 
Indeed, this is the only thing that ever has that keeps me going. And it's full of all of our stuff you can rummage in today. But again, it's just another physical tool in this digital world that people are excited to have a rummage in. It causes conversations. People take lots of photographs. So you see a lot on, I love Instagram. So people would tag it on Instagram. Often this more than any other picture at an event or a workshop because the quote's nice and it's a bit. It's not perfect. So for the cross stitches here, you can see all my mistakes. Um, it's a bit wobbly, but it's a, it's a nice, hopefully friendly, gentle thing. And it's my great aunt. So it's also good to remind people about make, do and mend, about having something that is reliable, that's not made in you know toxic ways. It's just cardboard, but it's lasted stronger than my dad's leather suitcase, which I think is interesting. Um, which he got when he was 10. So I used to use that and the handle broke and it wasn't very good. So it's a good suitcase. Thank you. So do have a rummage at the end as well. Yes. I was, um, I was hoping that we could suggest a recreational craft for you because you've made your craft <laughs> now to your, your job and uh, I think we can discuss that later. But let's take uh, your questions um, now if you'd like to yeah. ask Sarah. Oh, yeah, Something. there's a mic, so people on the yes, live stream yes. can hear. Mikki tyttö on täällä. Jos on kysymyksiä, kommentteja, mä tuon mikkiä, niin kaikki kuulee ne. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, thanks for going first. <laughs> I think that in Finland uh, the activism is mostly based on it has to be free or it has to be cheap. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And when I started googling your affairs, is that it... Etsy comes up <coughs> and your Etsy shop. Yeah. Yeah. And the kids. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? Yeah. Good question. It came about because when I first started doing it, I set up a blog called A Lonely Craftivist because I didn't feel like I fitted into the activist group and I couldn't find any other craftivists. It's the most emo thing I've ever done. It's highly embarrassing. Um, and it was like, oh, poor me. I'm just trying to figure it out, really. And people wanted to join in because they were introvert or crafty or didn't or felt burnt out. So I started saying, of, of course, you can join in when people ask to. You know, you don't want to say no. Um, but people around the world wanted to join in. So I started making little YouTube instruction videos to try and help people. And then people were saying, it's great, but I'm still not confident enough or, I'm, yeah, I'm still not sure... So I said, well, if I make a little kit, would that be helpful? So people were like, yeah, I could do that. And in terms of sustainability, kits cost money. I still had a full-time job, um, but I was making more and more kits, and I was asked to do more and more work, so I went part-time. And then, you know, I, there is a massive need, and my inbox is far too full. And it's still only, it's a collective, but it's me that runs all the bits. I have lots of volunteers, but no one wants to do the boring bits. Um, and I end up with, it's quite ironic, I end up with my own sweatshop, where I have all, all of my bits, and I make them in front of TED Talks or different things, and try and do it all. But it costs money. You know, I try and make everything as sustainably as possible. So most of our kits are made um, with donated fabric and threads from people. Um, it's mostly recycled cardboard and all of the kits are in a Ziploc bag so they can be reused all of the time. You have everything you can use um, ongoingly. So the thread and the needles and there's a postcard so you can reuse that. So it's trying to be as sustainable as possible. But you have to buy it. I mean, there's... I don't get any funding at all. And if I applied for funding, I would have to change a lot of the way I work because organisations will say, how do we prove that our investment in you is winning a campaign? So you end up doing stuff that isn't very good because you have to tick lots of boxes. So I'm really adamant on offering something that lets people figure out their own journey and look at different issues in their own time. And to do that, you have to buy things. But it's so hard because I'm constantly asked, why do I have to buy it? This is activism, it should be free. I'm doing something for you. So you should be paying me or it should be completely free. So it's a, and I hate talking about money. So it's a constant struggle to say, how else do you think I can afford to do this? Everything costs money and time and skill and expertise. And I get people saying, can I just buy the label or I don't want to buy it? 
but also one it sustains what we do so we can be flexible and support people but also um again I, when i work for charities you give out lots of free badges and pens and if you're like me i have some badges that i've paid for so i look after them more and i value them more than the free stuff which we tend to do in when we get things we value stuff we've um taken ownership of and we've invested in whether it's in money or time um so when people buy the kits they've invested in it they've invested in what i do and what we do so it feels more equal part of a movement um and that we're part of something together because they're supporting it and they're more likely to do it than if i just throw kits at everyone and you just go oh it's like when people give out flyers and you go oh. whereas if you have to buy a postcard you value it more so there's psychology behind that and the investment but it's a constant struggle that i do struggle with and it can feel really and this sounds really pitter you know poor me which is not meant to be at all but you do end up feeling not valued you know i spend hours making these things and when people go why do i have to pay it's like because i've spent years thinking about how this might work and if we work together we need a some you know it might be that we do a swap on something but i still have to pay for food so if i had to get a full time job which i might need to soon if the, if it's not sustainable then i won't be able to support people you know i'm only just about supporting as much people as i can and that's doing it full time um trying to do it with two as two part time jobs it's awful and i i was bad at both of my jobs because i was trying to do both well so it's really hard you know you either value and invest in it or it's not there and a part of me at this moment is can i afford it i live in london can i afford to live in london can i afford to still do this will i become a bent out craftivist which would be ironic um can i make it into something that is sustainable and i don't want it to be a charity where people just donate each month i want people to connect to it and not just you know do it transact Personally. but if anyone has any better ideas that can make it sustainable I will be all ears but it is a tough one and it's completely against the trend you know to say you have to buy activism is very odd but at the moment that's what I'm asking of people any other questions but we still have lots you can do for free as well yeah. so I always try and make sure that I do that and if I get paid enough from an organization to do something and there's a small group that has no money i always try and have enough to then do some stuff for free um because i'm not doing it for the money and if i was out you know i'm on much less than i was i'm not doing it for the money but i do need to do something sustainable but i do try and offer things where i can but it's a two-way process like anything i think yeah i hate talking about money on to the next one <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask hi. about uh, gender issues mm -hmm. because, uh, at least in Finland, uh, the crafts are very gender oriented. Yeah, and good um, like you said, the sort of old fashioned activism is masculine, mm. and crafts are feminine. How do yeah. you what do you think about that? Yeah, brilliant question. I um, was on a panel a few weeks ago in London for a national feminist conference talk when we were talking about this and I do you might some of you might have noticed that I don't use the f word a lot as in feminism or feminist um because I don't I think it's very people logically will think craft women gender issues for me my passion is global poverty and human rights whatever gender you are and you know the spectrum now is is much larger um it's not just two boxes <coughs> so i do i don't want people one I, i never want um people who aren't women to feel like they can't join in what we do wherever they are in the world i think that would be really upsetting because i see it as a tool for activism um we look at some gender issues because gender issues are part of most um injustices in the world and when you see you know when I, i was in ghana it was these older women and in in everton it was these grandmothers that were holding the communities together like really the gel holding them together and support and families and were the budget holders and really good at budgeting and really um really yet yeah, that the the rocks of communities so we need to get that right which is why it's always part of 
of NGOs work, there's always a gender stream, which is brilliant. And that's only been the last about 20 years. Um, and I think that's really important. But because craft is involved, again, I'm probably overly sensitive to make sure it's not explicitly about gender issues, because I don't want um, people who aren't female to feel like they don't fit into it. And I also, like, I got into craft not because of the history of it at all and I learned from YouTube. I got into it because of the therapeutic values and the, the focus on things. So it's, and the aesthetics are very gentle because it's very feminine and I think that's a real strength. But it could be that you focus too much on the women's, uh, people can box it off and I never want it to be boxed off. Which is why in all in our book and in all of our images, there'll be at least one token man, um, or there'll be trans, or there'll be queer, or there'll be you know there'll be a v vast um, variety where we can. We never pull people in and force them in at all. But you will see. My main worry really is it's very white in the UK because craft is expensive, so you get uh, you know. But then at the same time, that's one of the things I think is really good is that the craft community tend to be white, middle-class, middle-aged women who in the UK are highly influential, um, more so than other groups. So I find that really good. <laughs> Not that I want to exploit people or exclude them, but in terms of getting political change in the UK, this is the group that, and all charities know it and target women, which is why there's awful cupcake adverts and all of that crap of stereotype and these you know very intelligent women um but we know that white middle class women who tend to be from suburbia have a huge amount of political clout so that's another reason why i think craft is really good but it's a it's a it's like anything it's a it's a very complex and it's very um there's lots of contradictions within it, which is why I think we need to keep talking about it, but it's, which is also why I don't want to talk about the elephant in the room that much, because then people look at the elephant too much. I want people to look at the issues and see craft as the tool, rather than to look at the history of where craft has come from. So it's a great question, and something I, I've always got in the back of my head, niggling of where is it best to talk about feminism, where is it not? It's all that strategy again of what's the best method in different times. Does that answer the question at all? Maybe some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's one that I'm very aware of. So, and I'm really, I was, I made sure I was at that conference to hear what other people were saying as well and to to discuss those issues. But I also don't um, proactively sort out feminist groups to work with because I don't want um, men and other groups to feel like it is just for women's groups. So, no, and no, but that's what people in the UK, that's what people still do. So I always talk about how my dad's the biggest feminist I know. Um, and, as you know, at the moment we've got all of our three leaders, political leaders, wearing the I'm, this is what a feminist t looks like t-shirt, but people will automatically go into that. And I always think, I'm always devil's advocate, so I always think of the extreme worst, which is that. And in the UK, we're probably not as progressive as Finland, where it's still a real, this is a women's issue. So we've constantly got to tackle that and say, and I think we need a different word to feminism rather than change it and empower it and that's controversial as well and it's on this live stream um <laughs> but i do i do i and the same with activism part of me thinks we just need a different word for activism maybe we need solidarity mm -hmm. but then that's got a history mm -hmm. so yeah deep engagement mm. or a dignified yeah something yeah mm. maybe we need to start from mm. scratch on things mm. which is sad yeah. as well Okay. I don't know. Um, more ideas, comments? <laughs> Awkward silence. Well, I might have one hmm? just uh, thinking what you just said because there's a lot of uh, craft teachers, st students here, and me as one. We sometimes come across of a thought that it oh, it's just craft, like mm. it's not appreciated. Yeah. Do you come across of that? Do people just yeah. see your banners like a piece of fabric and stitches and they like miss what you're I saying or? 
I think people see that there's been time spent in stuff, so they might not see the skill, but often most people do see skill because it's, you know, neat and small and people think about the colours and we try and make it as embellished and delicate as possible. But there's definitely a thing with, so I work with lots of art institutions and, you know, you won't be valued as much as artists at all. I do some exhibitions when I have time to do because it keeps me stretching my work and I really like doing them when I can but again you're 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 put in a, a craft exhibition and not an art exhibition sometimes you are and I'm in more street art books now so there's three street art books that I'm in one comes out this year with Thames and Hudson it's like a big street art and it's really nice that they've put in my craft work but that's quite new that's only I wouldn't have a few years ago but there's I mean there's definitely I think less so now because of Tracy M and Grayson Perry in the UK is really pioneering craft now he's has got his own TV show which makes people really value the the ceramics and the tapestries he does as art but it's still I think a lot of crafters feel like they're not valued as artists um so sometimes it's our own baggage we bring to it but there's there is there does seem to be this separatism and a lot of courses art courses in the uk are very separate it's textiles and it's art or it's fine art and it's um yeah embroidery so i i work a lot with the royal school of needlework in the uk doing teaching them not technical stitch but teaching them more about visual communications and um different things but they would never see themselves as artists but i see that they are but it's yeah, but I don't think it devalues what we do. If anything, I think because it's craft, it feels a bit more humble and less about you being an artist and more you being a, a, ser a servant in the best sense, not a passive person, but someone who's using craft as a tool for activism and looking into um, the issues and using the craft to think about it rather than creating a piece of art to put on a gallery wall you know all of our stuff is trying to be as accessible as possible and like it comes down to the thing of it's activism and craft is a tool for it so i don't i do some craft for fun um when i have time but i do see i wouldn't call myself an artist at all and in exhibitions i don't and that's galleries don't like that at all and they say artist and I say no put craftivist and then I I used to do everything under the craftivist collective and now galleries get really annoyed and say we need your name in the craftivist collective which I don't particularly like but it's yeah <coughs> yeah so I'd see it as activism uses craft rather than art mm -hmm. thank you any more <laughs> questions I was just wondering, mm. uh, in this discourse, uh, what we're just going, uh, how do you see textile <laughs> art or fiber art uh, with, with your craftivism? Like, does they have something in common or, or how do you, what do you think about it? Um, well, I mean, I didn't go to art school or do a textile degree, so I don't really feel like I can say too much. I do work with lots of universities, which I love doing, but it's guest lecturing rather than doing courses. Um, but uh, there is there's in incredible pioneering going on, especially technology and textiles, which I just think is fascinating. Um, and there's a huge thing now, whether it's actually going to be reality, I'm not so sure. But, you know, there's a lot about um, technical clothes, functional mm. clothes that aren't just to wear, but also measure your heart rate or measure your emotions or let off whether you're uh, in love with someone, which I think would be really embarrassing, wouldn't it, for everyone to see? Um, I think that's really interesting but i also think it goes into the realm of big data which i just don't think we need i think you know there's lots of things we can do whether we need them is a different matter so we could just go well we could do this and we could do that a bit like the dark web often the competitiveness isn't about um drugs or paedophilia it's about how much fair that you could get in something and it happens to be in these really awful um areas that you know are not helpful but the competitiveness builds into that Again, for me, my craftivism, if it was too technical, 
people wouldn't feel like they could join in. So I can do some, you know, I can do a nice French knot now and I can do more technical stitch, but I purposefully don't in my craftivism because I want it to be approachable. I want people to see that it's a little bit naive and a bit wobbly because it makes it more endearing to people. If it's completely perfect and someone sees it on the street or it's a gift for someone, I do think um, that sometimes people could say, well, you clearly love craft. So your priority has been doing really good craft work and you're using activism as an excuse possibly, whereas my craft is still, you know, quite wobbly. So people see that I've tried really hard, um, but it might not be because I actually love craft, but I see it as a useful tool. So I want the effort to be 10 out of 10, but the execution might not be. And I think that's right, that it's the effort is the priority in terms of the aesthetics of it and I do I don't do it super simple because one I want it to be slow and people to make an effort but also I want people to feel valued in what they do so sometimes we have people who are really good at textile and stitch who come um, and they're really good at that side but they might not know so much about the politics and that helps challenging them or you might have someone who really knows about politics but is learning the craft. And it's lovely because they, there's when you do events, there's this um, sharing of skills and there's lots of intergenerational work that I just think is priceless. And because it's organic and not noticed or mentioned, it really forms groups and helps people engage. If it was too technical, if I looked at some of the textile artwork and said, we'll do that, one, it might be too expensive for some people to get involved, especially fiber art or 3D printing, um, or people might just go, I can't do that. And my whole thing is I want to empower people to do stuff. So the more technical it is, the more disempowering it is. So I, I think it'll always stay very amateur in the best sense of the word. You know, it's got negative connotations, but I want it to be as accessible as possible, but not too easy, but not hard. So I'm always, as you can tell in my head, I'm always like, I want to be here in this, who are not? <laughs> I think we are nearly at the end. I think we need to get out of here by <gasps> six. Yeah. So if we still want to have a little rummage around yeah. in your case and yeah. so on. And there are some people who pre-ordered books. So yeah. um, maybe we will thank you, Sarah, very thank much you so for coming. Thank you so much for coming. You didn't have to. So <laughs> really. and, and thanks for your brilliant questions. Mm. Really good questions. Thank that you. I still can't answer, but it makes me think. Which is good. It's good. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.